committee will come to order. This is a hearing on rhetoric versus reality. This is the second part uh, series today. We did an earlier one with the full committee this morning. This is assessing the impact of new Federal red tape on hydraulic fracturing and American energy independence. Uh, this is part of the oversight and uh, government reform. This is that subcommittee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have a right to know what they get from their government. We work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs uh, to bring the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. As we heard this morning, after, after years of worry about American supply of oil and gas, the industry has located significant new areas to explore energy, and the results have been quite remarkable. Last quarter, 58 percent of the oil that we used in America came from America. 79 percent of the oil we used came from North America. The United States is currently in a tremendous American energy renaissance. Through hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, domestic oil and gas reserves have the potential to create millions of new jobs and make the United States finally energy independent. Increased energy exploration and production is one of the keys to turning our economy around and putting Americans back to work. It is no coincidence that states with low unemployment rates are high in energy production. While technology has greatly increased the ability to find new oil and gas, this morning we learned and we heard a testimony from the full committee about the many ways the administration stood in the way of the American energy independence by slowing down additional production of coal, oil and natural gas. Under the Obama administration, red tape and endless government studies have discouraged new Federal permitting. The energy renaissance we heard of today is taking place almost, almost exclusively on private lands. We have a chart to be able to note how 96 percent of the new production that is occurring is occurring on private land rather than on public land. That, has, that is a loss of royalties and a loss of lease to the American taxpayers. Based on new regulation issued just last month by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Bureau of Land Management, it appears this a trend of underutilization of Federal lands will continue and may also be pushed and spread into private lands as well. The Department of the Interior, through the Bureau of Land Management, just proposed sweeping regulations of hydraulic fracturing on Federal and Indian lands that duplicate State regulations and threaten the decades-old primacy relationship of State regulations. In proposing the rule, the BLM did not assert that the Federal Government is in any better position to regulate fracking than the States, and BLM did not claim the States are not doing a good job. The President's BLM merely asserts that they are proposing the regulation on the basis of public concern. Ironically, this public concern has arguably been fostered by the U.S. EPA. In a multi-pronged attack on the industry, EPA has publicly lambasted specific energy producers and fracking locations for alleged problems, but later the EPA has only whispered the corrections when science proved the initial EPA assertion invalid. This all happened while continuing to issue a stream of regulations affecting hydraulic fracturing before the current federally mandated study has even been completed. EPA Administrator Jackson stated under oath before this committee, there is not a single documented case where hydraulic fracturing has demonstrably contaminated groundwater, but that has not stopped EPA and BLM from creating a series of new Federal regulations. This positive report and this record is due in part to the physics. There is another chart that I want to be able to put it there just to show and be able to put into the record as well. Fracking activity takes place a mile or sometimes well more, more than a mile below the aquifer line and through several layers of rock, I might add. But it is also due to an effective and comprehensive State regulatory regime. Regulators in energy resource st states like Oklahoma, my state, Pennsylvania, Utah, North Dakota, Texas, work closely with all interested parties, industry and environmentalists alike, to develop a regulatory regime that is responsive to advancements in industry while protecting the environment at the same time. No one, I repeat, no one cares more about the water resources of Oklahoma than Oklahomans and the people who live there. The assumption that Federal regulators from another State understand the geologic strata and energy process better than State enforcement is beyond credible. I also do not accept the assumption that local regulators cannot be trusted because they have political pressures that will discourage enforcement. But Federal regulators have only pure motives and no political agenda. Look no further than the former EPA Region 6 Administrator who stepped down in my region after it was revealed that he pursued and trained his staff in a strategy of crucifixion 
against oil and gas companies to keep the industry in line. This astonishing statement reveals that some in the EPA see people in my district as the enemy, and they assume their job is to control them instead of to serve the public. State regulators work closely with the Groundwater Protection Council to develop a website known as Frack Focus, which enables disclosure of fracking fluids while protecting trade secret information. State regulators also work with Stronger, the State Review of Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Regulations, which is funded in part by the EPA in the U.S. Department of Energy. Stronger is comprised of all interested parties, conducts exhaustive reviews of State regulation of hydraulic fracturing, comparing the existing regulations to a set of hydraulic frac fracturing guidelines unanimously adopted in 2010. If a State falls short, they work with Stronger to get them back up to code. Even so, EPA is moving forward with the confusing diesel fuels guidance, which turns the Safe Drinking Water Act on its head. In 2005, Congress specifically exempted hydraulic fracturing from regulations under the Safe Drinking Water because it is an ill-fitted regulatory framework. Congress granted EPA the authority to regulate hydraulic fracturing in a very narrow circumstance when diesel fuels were used. That simple statement seems very narrow and clear. But EPA appears to be attempting an end run around the statute by brazenly redefining diesel fuels to include virtually any petroleum product. This new regulatory overreach now threatens the entire system of State regulatory primacy under the State Safe Drinking Water Act. We can have safe energy exploration and production overseen by States and local authorities. There is a role for the EPA, but I am very skeptical that thousands of wells and many different types of rock and soil conditions across the country can be overseen from Washington better than State leaders who know the people in the land. We are so close to energy independence. This is a moment when we will finally solve a decades-old problem or the Federal Government will get in the way and slow or halt our economic future. Today is a pursuit of answers and clarity of the direction of the EPA and Bureau of Land Management to determine the goal of an administration who has stated they are for all of the above energy. And with that, I recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I note that votes are uh, occurring now, so I assume right after my statement we will probably yes. Yeah. That is correct. I thank the Chair. Um, I respect the Chair and I thank him for holding this hearing. Um, our philosophies could not be more different. I disagree with almost everything the Chairman has just said. Uh, frankly, we're, the Republican rhetoric in this body has been that the hobnail boot of government regulation has stifled the ability for the United States to achieve anything like energy independence, despite the fact that with EPA regulation and other regulation, our production of oil and gas and fossil fuels is going up, not down. We are on a trajectory to match Saudi production, the world's number one producer in the world. We are on a trajectory to come close to eliminating our dependence on foreign oil entirely. Somehow that happened in a regulatory, a robust regulatory environment. Somehow that happened with this President and his support for having everything on the table, including fracturing. That doesn't mean there aren't legitimate questions to be answered so that we can move forward with fracturing in a safe, environmentally safe and human health safe way. And those questions are not to be dismissed. And the idea that we are going to pit State regulators against Federal regulators and one is good and one is bad is, to me, to invite serious uh, regression in America. The truth of the matter is Federal regulation was seem to be required by Republicans and Democrats not so long ago, precisely because of the failure at the local level. Lack of resources, lack of will, sometimes political interference. And yes, gas and oil producing states sometimes skirted serious regulation in the name of economic advancement. Understandable, but not always in the public interest or a competing public interest. And so I say, we need reasonable regulation. We can all debate what reasonable is, but the idea that we don't need any regulation at the Federal level at all, especially in something as potentially serious to environmental safety and human health as fracturing, is a notion I reject and I believe most Americans will reject. Uh, we have evidence of toxic chemicals uh, that are involved 
in uh, the fracturing process, we have evidence of seismic events that may have been triggered by some of that process. And that is not a reason to say absolutely no to fracturing. It is a reason to try to be able to ensure the public that its interests are also being protected as we try to accelerate U.S. independence when it comes to fossil fuels. So I look forward to hearing the testimony, but I want to make very clear my sharp difference with the statements made by the Chairman here today. There couldn't be a more profound philosophical difference in our approach in this Congress uh, to this subject. And with that, I thank the Chair. Thank you. And uh, I will ask members to have seven days or allow members to have seven days to submit additional opening statements, extraneous materials for the record. And I would actually like, the uh, when you mentioned evidence of contamination of water sources on that, uh, Mr. Connolly, I would like to have any evidence that you have to be able to back that up, because the EPA administrators actually told us that she was not aware of any contamination of groundwater at this point. And uh, so any evidence that you may know of at that point, we would love to be able to add to the record as well. Certainly. And I would remind the Chairman that the Energy and Con Commerce staff conducted a study of chemicals used in fracturing and found at least 29 toxins, including carcinogens such as benzene, naphthalene, and acrylamide. The study found that at least 10.2 million gallons of fracturing fluid but contained at least one known carcinogen. I would be glad to submit the study for the record. Would, would not have a problem with the carcinogens being there in that. I understand that completely that it is used. The issue is, is it getting into the drinking water? Before I begin, I would like to recognize my colleague from Utah, Mr. Bishop, to do an introduction of one of his constituents who will sit on our panel today. We will we'll introduce the panel, but we will actually get into your testimony as soon as we come back from votes. I, uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Apparently, you have had one speech for, one speech against. Do I get to do the tie-breaking vote here? <laughs> uh, let's do an introduction. How about that? Uh, that is okay. You win anyway, Mr. Chairman. So I do wish to introduce Mr. McKee, who is being, going to be testifying to you probably about a half hour or so from now. Uh, he is the Uinta County Chairman in uh, my state of Utah. He has been that way since uh, been the chairman there since 2002. And I, hopefully, he is the chairman of the commission at this time. Okay, close enough. The, the importance of Uinta County, though, is very simple, that 50 percent of all the jobs in that particular county are tied up with the extraction industry. Sixty-five percent of all of the uh, natural gas that is produced in Utah comes from this particular county. This is somebody who can give you expert testimony from somebody who lives it and knows who is on there. So he can testify that even though regulations are established to solve problems, Sometimes when you actually establish regulation when there is no problem, the usual result is some kind of overreach in coming up with an abstract that does not fit the reality that happens to be there at the time. So I, I am appreciative of you giving him close attention to his testimony because he can tell you about this particular issue of fracking from somebody who does not have to take a four-hour airplane flight through three time zones to see the situation, but someone who actually lives it every day with his constituency. And uh, with that, I welcome him here, and I appreciate this committee taking on this important topic because fracking is a significant issue for uh, for the state, and it's a significant issue for our future of the federal government. And I appreciate you bringing expert witnesses like Commissioner McKee here as well. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Let me introduce the other three panelists in this. Ms. Roddenberry, Lori Roddenberry is the Director of Oil and Gas Conservation Division of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, also someone who knows well. Uh, we have done hydraulic fracking in Oklahoma since the 1940s, so this is not new, though I would assume Ms. Roddenberry has not overseen it since the 1940s as well. Uh, but we are very, very familiar with over 100,000 uh, fracks in Oklahoma uh, alone. And so it is something we are very, very familiar with. Dr. Robert Howarth, Ph.D., is the Director of the Agriculture, Energy, and Environment Program at Cornell University. Thank you for being here as well. And then also Mr. Michael uh, Kranzer, I had to slow down every time, obviously, again, uh, is in a return engagement. He was on the panel with a full hearing this morning. Thank you for staying over. He is the Secretary of Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, obviously, there is a lot going on, and this is a new thing in Pennsylvania compared to where we are in Oklahoma, where we have done fracking since the 40s. So you bring a lot of insight on how Pennsylvania is continuing to handle the state regulatory environment. With that introduction, we will start into uh, Ms. Roddenberry's testimony as soon as we get back. We have three votes in this series. We will get them done as quick as we can, and they will be right back and, and reconvene at that time. With that, we stand at recess.